Hi, I'm Alex Howard, and welcome to Secrets to Recovery Live. My guest in the studio today is Catherine Mountford. Hi, Catherine. Hi. And in Secrets to Recovery Live, as you probably know if you've watched the show before, we really look to explore different people's recovery stories, how they found their own journey, their own way out of ME chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia. And generally speaking, we interview people that have been patients of the Optum Health Clinic, but we also really encourage people just to talk about their journey and what's worked for them. So often we hear about other things beyond things we offer here at the clinic. And really what we're after is what's made the difference for different people, because it's worth saying everyone's recovery path is different. Some of the things that have been most transformational for some people make little difference for others, and that's part of the challenge of being someone with ME chronic fatigue, but it's also part of the fascination of the journey as well. So, Catherine, firstly, thank you for being here. I know that it's uh, often it's a, it's a kind of funny thing for people coming back. I yes. know that you, you did the nice day program yes. kind of in, in this kind of room. Yes, in with, this room, yes. Yeah, and I didn't have as much energy as I do now. <laughs> <laughs> understatement, <laughs> understatement. That's why you're, yeah. why you're sat, yeah, in, yeah. sat in this chair. Yeah. And I know it's kind of quite a funny thing, people kind of coming back to the kind of same building, same space, and yeah. kind of telling, telling their story. Yeah. But may, maybe as a starting point, you know, when did you first start? When did you know that something was happening in your life which was not perhaps the path that you had planned? You mm. started to get some signs and symptoms. Well, it was... August 2010, when I got what I thought was a virus. So um, I'd actually been backpacking for a year, got back in the May, um, went back to an organisation that I'd worked uh, with before and doing recruitment. Um, and so it was a known entity, really. Um, and then all of a sudden I got a virus. So it was, it was a couple of weeks. It was nasty. Mm -hmm. It was very flu-like. I was hot and cold. I was sweating a lot. It was really nasty. I lost lots of weight. I couldn't eat. Um, Went to the doctors, and they said it's just a virus. So that was a couple of weeks' period. And then between that sort of August and the Christmas time, I was dipping in and out of what felt like I'd nearly got flu, but not quite. So there was... It was just always there in the background. But it was like you hadn't quite I didn't fully feel recovered. I didn't feel I'd recovered, but yeah. I couldn't put a label on what was going on. Yes. And at that stage, you know, there was there was no sense that it was going to go on for the amount of time it sure, did. I understand. Um, so I I just assumed that perhaps I hadn't recovered. I was trying to do all the right things, your rest, whatever. Um, went to stay with my parents at Christmas. My brother and his family came over from Australia, and unfortunately they were when they arrived with something completely different. Um, but then I got the same again, and I was mm -hmm. really poorly. And uh, in a way, I kind of regressed to childhood because mum was there to look after me, <laughs> change the bed sheets, and, you know, sure. uh, generally sort of pat the sweat off my brow. And that was another bad period where I was really... in. It, it, it was very very sort of bad symptoms. So, um, but I was starting a new job in the January. Okay, and, and, and at, this, at this point, did you just assume it was, you had a virus? Like yeah, you, sure. You, you I mean, weren't just, labeling just, it as... No, I just thought, gosh, this flu won't go away and maybe I've just been unlucky and got flu twice and it didn't go away properly the first time. So uh, that was a six month period of just feeling like that. Then I started a new job in the, in the January. Mm -hmm. um, and for that whole year of 2011, which was definitely not my favourite year, mm -hmm. I kept having recurring flu-like symptoms, but also my fatigue was starting to get worse. Okay. Um, so fatigue in the sense of physical energy. Mm -hmm. So I was coming home from the new job and then literally going straight to bed. Actually, you know, I was falling asleep on the train on the way home. Okay. And, so and what, what kind of work were you, were you doing? Uh, I was doing recruitment, so I was recruiting okay. for law firms at the time. Okay. It was a fairly busy role. Yeah, it I'm was sure. uh, a lot of juggling, um, so client facing, yes. so meeting candidates, meeting clients, very much a giving role, yes. helping, supporting, kind of performing kind very of performing, yeah. um, and very much supporting lots of people through a tricky career change time. So, very much a, a giving role. Mm. Um, and so you were falling asleep on the train on the way home? And falling you asleep were, you were getting on the home. way in, getting home so absolutely soon. exhausted. Okay. And, and during the, the work, when I look back, I wasn't firing on all cylinders. I was finding it a bit more tricky than I had before. Mm. 
but I was dealing with you know multiple roles so it, and it's it, you know it really is, was juggling and I just didn't feel that I was quite juggling at the pace that I could juggle before I understand yeah I'd kind yeah. of slightly lost my juggling skills but and I was battling through anyway and I guess that that was very much your kind of achiever kind of pattern it's oh like yes. I've just I've got to keep going yes as opposed to you know I guess some people their body would give them symptoms like that and they'd go hang on something's not right I need to take some time to be with this and to mm. rest but yours was push through absolutely I, uh, so, o- override those feelings yeah. because they're weak and you sure. know as an achiever shouldn't be feeling it shouldn't be shouldn't feeling, feeling human like things. that no yeah. absolutely so what how, how do things move from that like what, what happened there well during that year i was confused because i didn't know what was going on so um i and i didn't throughout that whole year i must say i still didn't really know what it was until probably mm-hmm. towards the end of that year so I tried some things. I had an acupuncturist who was local to me. Actually, a friend's dad found her for me because I didn't have the energy to think about things like that myself. And that's one of the things that's often really challenging. Yes, at the time, we most need to find ways forward. We don't have the resources to do the research and to kind of that's seek right. things out. So yeah. I, I had some acupuncture, which I remember took me from no energy to a little energy. Mm-hmm. Five-minute walk would take me 20 minutes to walk and you know, covered in sweat when I got there because it was just so difficult. Mm -hmm. Coming back was a lot easier. The five-minute walk was more of a five-minute walk. So it helped sort of... So that's... You had a a noticeable difference between before and after. I did. But I think it was a noticeable difference from no energy to a little bit of energy. So I I only ever felt like the acupuncture was just pushing me up to... From 0 to 10. Maybe 10%. 10. Yes, that's right. And then I dropped back down fairly soon. I tried Chinese medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, I tried going back to the gym because I thought, well, maybe if I exercise more, that'll help. <laughs> How did that work out? Yeah, for you? It wouldn't work out particularly well, actually. I mean, in a way, um, you know, the the hormone rush I got from exercise it made me feel good because, as an achiever, I was doing something. Yeah. You know, I was. I, I, it was a tangible thing that I was doing. Yeah. Um, but it didn't really help. Um, I was going to the doctors quite often. Mm -hmm. I was saying to them that this can't be right. They were doing blood tests. The Mm -hmm. blood tests kept coming back and them saying, there's nothing wrong with you. So it was a very frustrating, tiring year. And as Mm -hmm. you said, when you don't have the energy, it's very difficult to know really what to do, Mm -hmm. how to do it, what conversations to have with whom. Um, so yeah, that was the year. But I think by the end of that year, it's quite difficult to remember the exact dates, but I must have read something which led me to think, ah, oh, this ME thing yes. looks familiar. And, and how, when, you, when you got that reference point, was that a relief? Because it, sometimes it can be a relief. Other times it's like, like a curse. I mean, it, people have very different reactions to, to kind of getting a label. How, yeah. how, how was that for you? I, I think it was a bit of both, actually. Um, I mean, it took another six months for the doctors to acknowledge that mm-hmm. I had it. So it was still more my own diagnosis, really. Mm-hmm. Um, but I actually rang the ME Association mm-hmm. um, and spoke to a very nice lady there who was yes. very helpful. And I seem to remember, again, it was all a bit of a blur, but there was a list that I could download from their site which gave me some things that you should ask the doctor. Okay. So it's almost like a checklist that you say to the doctor, look, please read this. Please do these tests because this is what I think I might have. Yes. It was really helpful, actually. Yes. Um, so I did, uh, until, until I got the f- proper diagnosis or the doctors agreed it was that, I don't think I felt like I'd actually got an answer. I think I was still sort of wondering if that's what I had, yes. really. Yes. Still questions. And so you, you got the diagnosis mm. and you got, you got a kind of clarification, let's say. Where, where did you... Because of course, one of the, the things that's most frustrating mm. about you get a diagnosis of chronic fatigue and it often it feels a bit like, what's wrong with me? You've got chronic fatigue. I know I'm chronically tired, but what's wrong with me? Like, it doesn't really tell you no. why you've got the symptoms that, no. that you've got. Um, and I remember that with when they did the diagnosis, um, they offered me some counselling, but it was at a hospital 40 miles away and it was only going to be half an hour. And I thought, hmm, that's... 80 mile round trip for half an hour. To try and get there in my state was going to be very difficult. I was very lucky. So I I thought, right, what can I do about this myself, being the achiever that I am? Proactive, yeah. Yes. So I uh, found a book called 50 Recovery Stories. Yeah. 
Alex Barsett. Yeah, exactly. It's a really good book. Yeah, fantastic. I think and it's I, called CFS Recovery: Fifty Stories. Fifty of Stories. Something. Yeah. yeah. And I thought, brilliant. If there's if there's fifty people recovered, that's a start. <laughs> that's a great start. And sure, and I, in, I think subconsciously, I thought they must have all done the same thing. So I thought, well, I'll buy the book. They'll have all done the same thing. I'll just do that. Yeah. And that of course, what's interesting is I, I, I was saying at the start of the interview, there are different, je- different paths. And what I like about that book is it shows different paths yes. that people have followed. Yeah. Which is not what I wanted. Right. <laughs> I wanted the same <laughs> path. Simple answer, I yes. wanted a simple answer, which I thought I might get. Um, so I read it through once and mm-hmm. thought, ah, right, okay, this is interesting. Um, and I read it through t- the second time, and I, and I went through with my highlighter and my biro and picked out anything that was a common theme. Oh, clever. Because interestingly, some people had recovered through one, yeah, one approach. One modality, so yeah. maybe for one person, Chinese medicine had done the job. Yes. Um, and maybe for another person, meditation had, mm-hmm. had done the job. For others, it, it was definitely a lot more complicated than yeah. that. But having underlined and highlighted, uh, one of the common themes was mention of the Optimum Health Clinic. Mm-hmm. But I believe when the book was put together, it was re- the clinic was in its infancy. It was. It's so funny. I, I, I remember, I mean, it's not relevant to your story, but mm. I, I remember talking to Alex Barson when she, when she was putting it together. And it must have, I can remember where I was sat. So it must have been back in 2004 that it was happening. And, you know, she was very clear in her vision that she wanted to illustrate this point of different mm. stories, different things yes. happening, different people. We were literally, we were in our first year, we were literally just starting out. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And so, yeah. so it wasn't that anybody had said... Uh, this is what I did at Optimum Health Clinic, but but there were several people saying, I've heard about Optimum Health Clinic and this is something we should look into. So I thought, well, I'm going to look into that then. And the other thing was I found, I tried the acupuncture and I knew it taken me to there. Yes. I tried the Chinese medicine and it did for me, it didn't do Mm -hmm. much. (laughs) I tried, at that stage, I'd also tried doing some Pilates and luckily I found a Pilates teacher who'd had chronic fatigue herself oh, wow. which was marvelous wow. so she really understood how I was feeling when I walked in looking like death um, and so I tried that and I felt that had got me to 10% I was thinking I could be years trying mm. these individual things so it was the holistic approach and when I thought hang on a minute if I can go somewhere with a holistic approach mm-hmm. it, it's it must be worth doing it must be worth starting with that umbrella view than mm-hmm. trying to keep picking away at different things over the years because I thought this could take me years and mm. I I didn't want to spend years I recovering. understand you wanted to live your life not well, spend I'd, it I'd, trying to get better yes yeah. I, I mean by that's just after then I had to give up working um, because I, I couldn't how, how, how was that so kind of someone that it sounds like somewhat had defined yourself yes. by your career and your achievements I have yeah. to acknowledge that you couldn't keep pushing through It was awful. It's one of the most upsetting things I've ever been through Mm. because my whole identity had gone Mm. and I didn't know what I was anymore or who I was. And an identity you'd worked hard to build up as well. Yes, I was a hard-working career person. I had a really successful career in in marketing and business development. I worked in big law firms. I'd been posted overseas twice. I'd I'd, you know, I'd taken on big roles, achiever type, you know, pushed myself to the limit. Um, but I, I was known as the hard-working career girl and partied hard as well, mm-hmm. you know, that was, mm-hmm. that was my life. Um, I found the having to give up work extremely hard. I found it very upsetting mm. and actually it probably upset me until fairly recently. So it's what, taken what, a good what, couple was, of years. Was there a part of you which, which felt a relief at not having to keep up the facade and keep pushing? Or was it primarily just this feeling that you were losing a sense of identity? Now I have relief, but okay. that's taken not me how you felt a long time, time yeah. to come to terms with. And there are still days where I still... It's like, a, I'm, like, it's like I'm grieving for the old person mm. because the old person felt good because I, I was working in the biggest law firm and I was a senior manager and I had managed a team in Asia and I'd done all the things that I thought mm-hmm. made me something mm-hmm. great you know hadn't looked after myself hadn't nurtured myself mm-hmm. really at all um so it no it really was a grieving for that and then a well what am I if I'm not this if I'm not that what am, am I what I? do I yeah. tell people you know how do I relate to people um and I even felt that my relationships with some people well they changed I'm sure yeah. because to them, I wasn't the person I was. I mean, I, I wasn't the person going out and having a good time because I couldn't go out and I couldn't stay awake. I could hardly go out, you know. So I wasn't the party 
on the dance floor to the end of the night person either. Mm. And, and I guess some people in my circle of friends wanted me to be that. Sure, Because I sure. wasn't that anymore. Then that, that's who they knew you as. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So I, I, for me, it was really hard. Mm. Yeah, really hard. And so, so what happened in terms of your recovery from there? So you, you stopped work. So you, I actually, you, I, sorry, I, I was, yeah. so I signed yeah. off from work yeah. um, for four weeks. Um, okay, okay, four weeks initially. It, okay. it was a real crash moment. I was, I was staying at my boyfriend's and um, bless him, Ian's been with me the whole time that I've been ill. And but but been interesting, you, you, you mentioned before we started filming, you met him once you were already ill, which is you know, he's quite, be quite he's beautiful incredible. that he's, he's kind of met you in that place and supported you through. I, I'd say that I'm very fortunate. I think Ian's one of the key reasons why mm. I've, I've fully recovered. Mm. Um, to have somebody who without has never questioned, never... Uh, you know, a number of times we've not gone out and he's had to just watch me asleep on the sofa. Sure. Or I've f fallen asleep halfway through a conversation. <laughs> Can't be good for your ego, really, can it? But bless him, no, he's been uh, absolutely amazing yeah. and very supportive and it has made a difference. Sure. But this, this particular Sunday, I was at um, his house and um, I was asleep most of that weekend. And on the Monday morning, I was getting up for work and I literally couldn't physically open my eyes. Mm -hmm. It was kind of reached a point it where just pushing my through body was had just, just not an option. There was yeah. nothing left, yeah. nothing at all. I couldn't yeah. talk. I couldn't. So uh, Ian had to call my dad and say, "I think I think you need to come and come and pick her up." He he was working. He mm -hmm. could not work. Mum and dad enjoyed their early retirement by having me back moving in with them. <laughs> <laughs> not quite what they planned. Strived all their lives. Oh <laughs> yes, just to have me back in the house in my late thirties. Um, so I, I had the four weeks signed off. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to work. Uh, and during the, that, that period of time was when I fortunately managed to get in to do the 90-day program. Right. In that four-week period. Of course, period. You, okay, it's right, because you, you'd read uh, Alex Barton's book. Exactly, read recovery. that, done yeah. my 15-minute talk, yes. um, decided with, with the lady who I spoke to, whose name I can't remember, I'm sorry, that we the 90-day program would work for me. For you, yeah. So came down here into this room. Um, so probably around there somewhere. Somewhere <laughs> around there somewhere, yes, feeling really um unhappy yeah um sure. and and then i went back to work part time assuming that i would be okay um but it was fairly soon afterwards that i realized that having decided i was finally going to nurture myself and get myself back to something normal that actually trying to do this really stressful work probably it just it was just counter productive yeah. if you wanted your recovery to happen you had to make it the number one thing which is often the thing that's so difficult when we because you mentioned earlier the kind of achiever and helper yes, pattern before, me, we, before yeah. we started kind of yeah. filming but it, when you've got the helper pattern part of what's really any achiever pattern but especially mm. the health pattern part of what's really hard is to make ourselves the priority and yeah. we're so used to being this identity of helping others and doing things and to make your recovery the most important thing is often an absolute necessity but it's difficult for people yeah. to do that. I Practically still difficult, but also emotionally difficult. Very, and I still find that hard now. The putting myself first thing I find very difficult. Mm. I, I, I sometimes, you know, I still get those guilty feelings. Or I've, you know, I'm, I'm just indulging in myself mm. because that's just how I was for so many years. So, it was a tough decision, but it was necessary. I wasn't performing in my job. Mm -hmm. you know, I couldn't. You couldn't uh, be the achiever anymore, anyway. I couldn't. I wasn't achieving. Yeah. You know, I was letting myself down. I felt I was letting clients and candidates down. My cognitive ability was just not there. Mm. You know, sometimes I would be interviewing somebody and not really being able to understand what they were telling me. Yes. You know, I could hear the words, but my brain couldn't process what those words meant. Yeah. I couldn't carry on like that. I understand. You know. I understand. And so. You came and you did the 90 day program. Yeah. How was that? And you can be honest. So it might have been <laughs> sometimes, you know, sometimes obviously I know it helped you, but it were, initially were you cynical and skeptical? Were you, were you open? D did you have an impact straight away? Was it a slow burn? Like, what, what was your experience? Um, I had a few major light bulb moments. Walking in, there was eight of us, mm -hmm. um, six of whom had had ME for a long, long time. Right. And some of them were showing physical, serious physical symptoms as well. So my initial impression was, gosh, Is this look where I, where I look am. Where I am. Yeah. How on earth did I get here? Um, 
and also with my helper patterns, I was upset for them and desperate sure. that I could it's help them as well. You know, I, yeah. I didn't want to see anyone in that situation. Um, the ninety-day program for me, there was two or three major light bulb moments, um, which really, as far, as far as I can see, kickstarted my recovery. One major one was that about my inner critic, um, and I remember Jess, who was our course leader. <laughs> talking about our inner critic, how we talk to ourselves. Um, and she said, I think about how you talk to yourself. Would you talk to a five-year-old child like that? Oh, I remember thinking, gosh, no, because that would just be so awful. And then she said, so why do you talk to yourself like no. that? Big light bulb moment for no. me. I thought, I've, t I've, I've pretty much spoken to myself like this for as long as I can remember. This constant, you're not good enough, you're not working hard enough, you're not being Which successful enough. Which is what, of enough. course, drives of the course. achiever and the helper. And I've often asked managers who've said to me, you're taking this all too seriously, Catherine, you know, you're pushing yourself too hard. But I've, I've often asked them, I don't know how to keep striving without that. Yes. I've never known how I could achieve in life without having that very negative, nagging voice. Yeah. I mean, you know, let alone how you was taught to a small child, most people wouldn't talk to their worst enemy no. like that. You know, the, the level of ongoing self-criticism mm. and self-judgment that often is there for people. Mm. And it's like when you start to really, it can be quite shocking when you start to see yes. what you've normalized to in terms of how you are with yourself and how you treat yourself. And I still do it. It's still my, it's still my core value set that I have to override and work with the whole yes. time you know it's yes. still there it's ready to come out whenever it wants to but i imagine it's quieter and i imagine you have more awareness around i'm aware it. of it right it is quieter i'm aware of it and i can talk back to it now as oh, well <laughs> <laughs> in my own way in my own head no one will ever know <laughs> not walking along the path you know um, suddenly developed to rats yeah that's walking, right that's right yeah so that was a massive yes. learning point for me um, so there were a couple of things. Was there was, was there? and I was, and actually, then I was trying to remember the second one, and it's I don't have brain fog anymore, right, so I can't back. use that as the excuse <laughs> that I used well, to. Well, but what I'm also curious is, is, is in the kind of recognition and the awareness that kind of happened, uh, how did that impact on your actual symptoms? So the kind of the fatigue and the kind of you know the the, the fact that you were so ill you weren't able to work mm. at this point, mm. and it's one thing to see that you're criticizing yourself and you're judging yourself and yeah. start to get some distance and quietening of that. But it sounds like that had an impact on your actual physical health yes. as well. So t t talk us through that. Well, what I was like then or how I then used well, that for well, recovery. Well, how, yeah, how, how it impacted your recovery. Mm. So a recovery was not as fast as I wanted it to be. <laughs> it rarely is, I'm afraid. Being the achiever. <laughs> certainly, so certainly lasting recovery is not, not Yeah, and actually, quick. in a way, I think the following 18 months was almost harder than the really bad points the really because you get a sense that you're recovering and therefore you just want to be recovered yes and that recovery then seems to take forever it did for me i know everyone's well, different but for it, me it seemed to take forever it can be very frustrating when you get a taste yes you get like a few right. hours, you get an hour or a few hours exactly. where you feel normal and you go oh my like suddenly feeling normal feels like amazing mm. <laughs> i can feel normal and then it goes away again. Exactly. And that can be incredibly frustrating to yeah. people. Yeah. You know? so and then you feel, sorry, you, no. you, you feel better for a bit. So you start trying to do all the things you want to do. And then the symptoms come back and, mm. and get you because you've done too much too quickly. That can be very frustrating. And I well. had some of that. I would say for the four, so I went to then live with my parents in their early retirement yes. for four months. Um, and during that time, I'd say that physically my symptoms improved but the slightly i was sleeping okay. a lot uh, a lot i mean i feel like i was probably sleeping for the last 20 years i mean you were sounds like you were, we talk about three stages of recovery mm. and that there are, there are videos we put out that people, people can look at but it sounds like you were very much in stage one which is the crash stage which is defined by needing a great deal of sleep yeah. and the only well not the, the, the 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 critical ingredient to move from stage one to stage two is to allow that rest yes. but that's difficult if you're an achiever and a helper and you keep fighting it so it sounds like that a part of the big transition for you was actually giving yourself permission to feel the tiredness and do, right. and do the resting that needed to be yeah. done. And my mum and dad live in a tiny village um, in the middle of, well, they're, they're near Cambridge, but the, you mm -hmm. know, they're in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. It was, there, I remember it was quite a sunny summer there. 
and they've got a lovely swing seat in the garden. Beautiful. So, um, and they were wonderful and cooked and looked after me and made me feel like I did when I was a kid, you know, made me feel yeah, safe nourished, again. Yeah. And it did help. I was very fortunate with that. So I was fortunate with Ian, I was fortunate with my parents doing that as well. So I did have permission, almost from them and from myself, to just sleep. Mm. I didn't have any choice, really, to be honest. But I well, you, the choice you had was the longer you'd fought it, the mm. worse it would have got. Yeah. And you know, you fought it quite hard by the sounds yes. of it. Yeah. So you could have fought it harder, which would have made it even worse. Yeah. And it sounds like eventually there was enough awareness. Partly you had no choice, but partly there was an awareness that I have to honor my body and mm. I have to listen. That it needs sleep. Fighting it is not getting me anywhere. Yeah. I have to allow my body to have the rest that it needs to have. Yeah. So I read your book okay, and went through that. I think I read that twice, actually, because mm -hmm. I was, again, you know, just keen to get inspiration from other places. Um, I was doing my meditation, which I'd picked up. And I, actually, when I look back, I'd, I'd, for quite some years, I'd been tr intrigued by meditation. And something in my mind had thought, I bet this would be good for me. <laughs> I kind of <laughs> knew that deep down this would probably help, but never really got round to doing it. Yes. And it was always this thing that you had to learn to do. I always thought it was something that like, you had like to do be skilled, of course. Thing, yeah. um, and we did a bit of meditation on the 90-day program. Yes. And I realized, no, actually, this feels amazing. And mm. I just want more of that. So I um, obviously used the CDs, did a lot of mm -hmm. meditation, mm -hmm. did bits of yoga, spent lots of time on that swing seat, getting some mm. sun again, you know, not being stuck in an office over a laptop. Just you know, feeling I, grounded. I think and my, feeling probably the my lungs opened up a bit sure, and sure. I just generally felt I had more oxygen and felt I could breathe. So that was a four month period where I don't remember having massive energy, but I was, I was going to see a wonderful lady in Cambridge called Rachel Hawes who. Um, had Emmy herself and fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. um, and she did a sort of Pilates yoga mix with me, which mm -hmm. really helped. Mm -hmm. Some really basic movements. I mean, when I think where I've come from now, because now I'm a nutrition coach and a personal trainer. I was going to say, it's like personal so, training yeah, is like a exactly. higher level from. So when I think back, you know, I was sort of, you know, lying on my foam roller and just doing that. Um, ma ma mastering Shavasana or corpse pose. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's, that's what I was doing. But. Um, it helped. It really yeah. did help. So I did feel that over those four months, I was getting uh, a slightly more energy. I was able to have more conversations, um, not not any real socialising going on. Then Ian and I moved up to Chester. We decided that both of us felt that London had done us good, but and maybe not I done me particularly done good. Done us good. Done us fast. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> he was working in the city as well. Had also had a very busy career. Lived abroad. You know, worked very hard mm. and. Uh, we decided that actually for us both it would be lovely to get away from London and probably the thing I needed to get mm. away from perhaps what had in some way caused yes. my, my problems. Um, so we chose Chester slightly randomly. Won't, lo won't bore you with the story. Um, and then over that year, I was still not working. So again, fortunately, Ian not only psychologically and emotionally looked afterwards but after me but also financially practically, yeah. practically yeah. enabled me to have some time again and was very encouraging of me doing nothing this was very alien to me you know i, I was that, yeah. uh, but, and i think without him doing that the chances are i could have slipped back into old patterns so yes. again i'm especially what, what can be very difficult is an energy starts to return it's like we want to use it, yes. you know, and that takes a great deal of discipline. You know, when, yeah. when you move from stage one, to stage two, stage three, to actually let your recovery be more important than what you do. Mm. Because often what we tend to do is define our recovery by how much we do that day, which may mean we're defining our recovery by how much we're overdoing it, as opposed to measuring it by how much healing is actually taking place. Yeah. And the energy needs to be used for healing, not just doing activity. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, uh, it was a difficult year. I was, I was trying to recover, and the trying was filling my bucket up, yeah. as I remember, yeah. on the course before I'd even started. So my bucket was probably half full before I'd even got out of bed because I was sure. already thinking, well, I've got, I've got to be better than I was yesterday. And so that achiever stuff is, you know, is, is really ingrained. But over that year, given the time and the space, I started to explore the food side of things as well, which mm -hmm. is how I've ended up doing what I'm doing now. Um, and actually, I, I had at one point been diagnosed with IBS 
because bowel yes, yeah. because obviously my digestive system was completely shot as I'm well. I'm surprised after everything you've described. <laughs> um, so th one of the doctors prescribed was said I had IBS, and and the IBS diet is so nutritionally poor. <laughs> You know, sort of I better be careful about no comment for white, legal reasons, but yes. White bread and all these other things. So, and I was on that for a while. And then it came to me and I thought, I, was re I, I did a lot of reading. I mean, all sorts of books. I, anything I could get my hands on to read and try and learn. Um, and I was coming across some blogs uh, where, you know, talking about the value of good nutrition. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started eating all natural food. I cut out all stimulants. So I cut out... Um, all sugar, caffeine, alcohol. Mm -hmm. I actually cut out wheat and dairy as well because mm -hmm. obviously they're quite um, hard on the digestive sure, system. Sure. And I think I'd had problems with wheat for quite some time anyway. And I went on a, a very all-natural, healthy diet. And it contributed enormously to my energy levels picking up. And it's interesting, you know, sometimes people make much more complicated nutritional changes in terms of supplements and like... But sometimes simply just changing what you eat something as simple as that can mm. make a big big difference for people. just taking out the stimulants i think made a massive mm. difference you know now i understand why because the stress that they were putting on my mm. body um that sort of maladaptive stress sure, response sure, you know that sure. was just fueling that to continue totally um whereas you, you, you can be you can have anxiety which is biologically induced. You put too many stimulants in, the body can't handle it, and you feel wired, but it's, it's as much down to what you've eaten and what you haven't eaten That's right. as opposed to what's happening psychologically yeah. sometimes. And I realised I wasn't eating enough. I was working really hard. I was under a lot of stress. I was trying to stay slim, mm. you know, which... <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, that's No what... achiever passing going on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, so I was, you know, not eating too much. And sure. And probably not eating enough sometimes. No, I wasn't. Yeah. Um, I eat loads now. I eat tons. Yeah. I just all eat, eat all of the good stuff, yeah. you know. Um, so, and, and so that really helped. And I carried on doing the meditation. The lady, Rachel, who I mentioned, actually carried on helping me uh, via Skype. So I mm -hmm. had some sessions <laughs> with her to just help me through the kind of grieving process yeah. of not being career woman. Yeah. Um, we'd moved to Chester. I did know some people there, but I found I st once I started getting a bit better, I started feeling really lonely. More lonely than when I'd been very because ill. Because you could go out, but you didn't have people to go out with. Well, I didn't much, have or? a job to do, and I yeah. didn't have a purpose. Have that that was the big thing. Life, yeah. No purpose. I felt really, I felt really uncomfortable not having a purpose. Yes. But I didn't have enough energy. To have a purpose. I, know, I understand. You could feel there was something that was absent, it was yeah. missing, but there wasn't the energy to go and resolve that and yeah. to, to do yeah. something with it. So I, I played the cello, so I'd managed to join an orchestra up there, but I found the evening rehearsals really challenging. And then yes. the whole of the next day I'd be wiped out. Yes. At least that gave me a little bit of a purpose. Yeah, something to look forward to. Something in your to week. look forward yeah. to. I did some bits of walking. Um, but what I did do was I started my first sort of nutrition-related blog, a Facebook page called What Catherine Eats, which was basically pictures of all the food I ate. <laughs> and it was... A it, good motivation, I imagine. Well, it was. Right it actually, it was in a way. It held me accountable. Yeah. But also, I friends started asking me questions because they could see that I was recovering. Yes. So people were starting to take note and saying, well, you know, what, what have you done? And when I'd explain the stuff around the psychology and the meditation and the inner critic didn't necessarily resonate with mm -hmm. a lot of people. When I mentioned the food, of course, everyone immediately wants to know, yeah. well, what do you eat? Yeah. And still yeah. now, everyone asks me, what do you eat? Because they want the magic answer. Yeah. Well, if you have one courgette a day, you'll be, you'll be perfect. An apple a day keeps the doctor oh, away, yes. apparently. It's not, not quite as simple as that. So I, it was, I, I suppose I started it to share it with friends, mm -hmm. but then people I didn't know started following it because I was saying, look, this has helped me boost my immune system, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and it gave me a purpose. Yes. And I really and it gave you some contact with people. Some contact, well. some communication, some feedback. Made me feel like I was worth something. Um, and yes, and it helped keep us on track as well mm. with food. So that that was a big change year. It was very. There was some real lows and some real highs. Um, but the recovery took way longer than I wanted yeah. it to. Okay, and so, but it sounds like a lot of really wonderful things yeah. happened in that time. Yeah. It just ha wasn't quite the agenda that you had, but yeah. nonetheless, the, the healing took place. Yeah. And so, 
what was the point where you you really knew you were coming to the other side? Like, the, the, were there kind of certain um, benchmarks, certain kind of things that when you reached those points that they were kind of illustrative of, of where you'd got to for you? Yeah, I, I, people, a few people have asked me this and there's nothing that I'm really aware of and actually other people might notice it. Yes. So if I asked Ian, he might say, it was actually, that do you remember? Did, yeah. I can remember a lot of things we didn't do because I couldn't, but sure. it's, it's easy to remember those. I mean, it was just a gradual thing. There was, there was an ability to walk and then, I mean, I love country walks, absolutely love them. So I was able to do a country walk and not feel... And not be wiped out for three days. Exhausted yeah. for three days. Or I could go out for the evening and socialise, um, not drink, but still be there for a couple mm. of hours and be able to communicate. So it was more gradual. I, there was no, for me, there was no big moments. But once I got to a certain point, the rest of the recovery seemed to really speed up because over the next few months, I suddenly decided that I was going to study to be a nutrition coach, which I did with Precision Nutrition, hmm. and trained to be a personal trainer. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> which I of course involves going to a gym and exercising exactly, and all of that, it, and you also had the energy to do that. It, it, exactly. Do you, do, you, do you know what happened in those few months? Like, was it just you? You reached a certain point where there was a resilience mm, that was there, I or think was there so. any particular mindset shift or physical thing that you changed? I think maybe uh, acceptance. Maybe I'd finally accepted where I was. Yeah, so you weren't constantly trying to get ahead of where you were, mm. therefore you could actually settle. Yeah. I'd let go of the, the need to identify so much with the past, therefore I could look to, some, to being something else, maybe. Yes. Um, that was probably one thing. Um, I guess just, there was just a general sense that life was becoming more normal again and yes. I was becoming... Whatever, whatever that is, of yeah, course. Yeah, I know. I don't like that word really. <laughs> but I know, is, I know what you, I know what you no mean. You, like, you had the energy to do the normal things in life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, but, uh, and I suppose... I think it got to a point where I was still believing that I couldn't do as much as I actually could do. Right. And again, I know I keep mentioning Ian and he's, he's watching this, so he... He might be a bit embarrassed, but he is he has been very critical in this. And I suppose the message that that might help for other people, because it's all very well, I'm not can't, I'm not gonna loan Ian out. To is anyone, he not is he not available for no, rent? He's not, definitely not. We're getting that's married that's, that's in two months' time. I'm keeping hold of him. Yes. <laughs> you could probably yeah. charge a good it's rate. There's a business opportunity <laughs> there, isn't there? It's not like me to, to, to miss out on a joint venture. But there you go. Um, but I rem he, he instinct he seemed to instinctively know with me when to push me and then when I also needed to rest. Yes. He just seemed to know. So I remember it got to a point where I was holding back, saying, oh, I can't do that, I can't do that. He was saying, no, you can, you can do this. And he was right. Yes. So it took a bit of... And it sounds like he wasn't pushing you. What he was doing was no, inviting and encouraging No, it was encouraging. You. Yeah. But he, he could sense that when I said, oh, I don't think I should go out because I'm going to be tired, he'd say, oh, I think you can do it. And, and I could. So it, it did... I mean, I'm not going to give him all the credit. <laughs> It sounds like he's played a really fundamental he role. Has. And, he you know, has. you've also done the work as well. And it's been I a team done, effort. You it know, it and, has been a team and that, effort. And, and, you know, not everyone has that support. When people do, of it course. makes a big difference. And when of they course. don't, what people have to learn to do is to find that way to support themselves. Mm. And just like you were saying, there's times to take the pressure off and times to give some gentle encouragement. Mm. And we can also learn to do that for ourselves. You know, and that can be part of people. You, right. And you, you did learn that. And yeah. so we have to learn that even more if we haven't got another person. And it's great when we have people around us that support us. But I think what helped that process was that I was very honest with him and I shared pretty much everything I'd learned on yes. the 90 day program with him, which, you know, there's some stuff in there that can sound a bit weird and wacky to I really people. <laughs> I'm not always aware of that. You know, I mean, come on, let's all tap together. You know, not everyone's embracing of that Are stuff. They not? I no, didn't know it's that. funny. Yeah. yeah, just look on Twitter for half an hour. You'll soon work it out. Um, but you know, so I was. I suppose I made that happen by sharing, and I suppose asking. So making you know, him part of it. it exactly, yeah. and yeah, it and did make a difference. Yeah. yeah, and, and I, I have been very open to personal development over the years. So I suppose that helped. You know, I yes. was very open to sharing it and asking him to, to support yeah. me so yes yeah, so then it was just a you know a kind of complete 
felt sort like of, a rocket at the end. It was a, a real like. rocket once I thought, actually, yeah, I have got the energy. Yeah. Um, and and what, what, what's it like now? You know, you're kind of, you're working as a kind of nutrition coach and personal yeah, trainer and yeah. you're getting married in June and Ooh. you're just moving house, I think you were mm. saying, before we mm. went, on, went on air. So, you know, your, your life is full, mm. let's say. What, what, what's, it, what's it like to be able to do those things and enjoy doing it's them? It's amazing. It's um, it's more amazing than it was before I was ill, of yes. course, because yes. I know where I've come from. Um, and actually, sometimes I think already, perhaps I forget how fortunate I am, and I need to remind myself. But uh, there are some times when I'm walking in the countryside, and I'll go, <laughs> I can't believe I'm going to say this on air, I might go and hug a tree or touch well, a tree sorry. maybe or something. Yeah. I'm just so delighted to be out doing stuff. Um, and to be able to enjoy doing it rather than live in fear of how you're going to feel at the end of yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Um, I, do, I, I, don't, I really don't take it for granted. Um, and I went with, there's a, a, a walk I'm doing in a few weeks' time. Where actually, sadly, we, we were at school with a, a, a friend who, and she lost her life in November to cancer. Mm. So there's a group of nine of us doing a big walk in, in aid of her in a few weeks' time. Again, it's a half mm. a ma marathon, wow. and I can do it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I was walking with a couple of friends doing a training walk, and I suddenly just... I just did The Hills Are Alive with the Sound of Music because <laughs> I thought, I can do this. It, it's that, it, it's, there's that much elation. Yeah. Uh, it's, it is wonderful. It is wonderful. Now, I wouldn't... I'm, I'm still managing my energy. No, I understand. You know, I'm still managing my energy. I'm still, I'm still eating what I eat and what I tell all my clients to eat because it's real natural right, food and it also works. Also, walking your talk. I'm which walking is also my talk. Um, one you know, of the things I, I don't come off air and go to McDonald's. And, you know, it's like there's well, a certain integrity. In. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it is an integrity, but it's more than that. It's what I want to be doing. Yeah. It's, it's what makes you feel great, eating yeah. Great food, nutritious food, and nourishing you your body. Exactly, it's it's a form of um, of, of nurturing, isn't it? it mm. um, I'm saying to myself that I'm worth this great food, um, and you know that, and and it feels great. So, where were we? So we were talking about what's it like to be on the other side and to be yeah. wow and to be able to do Yes, do as I was saying, though, I still yeah. have to manage. I do yeah. still have to manage. Yeah. So I still have to. I mean, I still want to eat the, the food. I still do keep an eye on my energy levels. Yeah. I make sure I sleep well at night. I don't take on too much. I try mm -hmm. not to take on too much stress, although moving house, wedding. Moving house, getting married, new business. Running my own <laughs> business, yeah. You know, there's a lot there. Um, but, but, I, but in a sense, what, what you're illustrating is you've learned the lessons from being ill, which is definitely. the reason why you burnt out. Yeah. It's because you didn't take care of those That's things. That's right. You know? And you know, when pe you know, people sometimes have relapses, and when they mm. have relapses, it's nearly always because they've, they've forgotten the lessons. Yeah. And it's not that you, know, you have to be careful to protect your recovery, but if you've gone back and lived in all the ways you lived before you got ill, there's mm. a pretty good chance you're going to recreate the same thing. Yeah. So there's a way on the other side of, of not being obsessive and having to be careful all the time, but of taking care of yourself yeah. because, you know, that's what it means to, to live as a healthy, vibrant, optimally well person. And I never want to go back to how I was. I mean, that, that time when my dad had to come and pick me up and I, I can just remember, it, you, just, you just don't want to go back there. No, so whatever it. it takes, I will carry on doing yeah. so that I do whatever's in my means to not go back there. Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're pretty much out of time, but just as a kind of, kind of closing thing, mm. when you look back on the years that you've been ill and, 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 and what's happened, what, what, what's the lesson or lessons that you take from that? Like, what would you say to that you that was kind of being picked up by your dad, you know, from you know, on a Monday morning, mm. unable to kind of move to get to work? When you look back on that, what, 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 what have you learned from all of this? I've learned to spread the word to other people, mm. not to put work or career or supposed written achievements before living for yourself and mm. nurturing yourself. So even when I'm working with clients on nutrition, actually, it's a lot about life in general. Sure. Sure. And the key thing I'm saying to them is live life to the full. You know, do what makes you happy. Um, if you're in a job that's causing you stress, have a think, what else can you do? So I've learned that from now on, life will be how I want it to be. Yes. And if that means it's not a 
social norm or what I think was a social norm, it doesn't matter. Um, to have balance, to take care of myself and to put myself first. And that doesn't mean that I don't think about other people because sure. I still do. You put your own gas mask on or uh, whatever they call it before you that's do something right. else. That's right. And yeah. that's the, those are probably the big lessons I've learned. Um, and if, I, so if, if I'm no good, I'm no use to anybody else. If you haven't got your oxygen mask, you're not going to be able to put it on someone else. So I think they're the, yeah. key, the key lessons. And right. the food and the diet has been a big lesson. Yeah. For, for the rest of my life, I will nurture myself with food and I'll try and make sure that everyone else does as much Spread as the possible word. as well. Yeah. Yeah, so. Well, Catherine, thank yeah. you for spreading the word here. Tonight. No, thank you very I much really for having me. It's it. wonderful to be back in this room in a... A in a different place. guise, so yeah. thanks. It's been great. great. And thank you to the Optima Health Clinic. It, has, it oh, really did make a big difference, so I'm thank glad you. glad we helped, but you yeah. did the work. Yeah, so thanks. Thank you. thank you. And thank you for watching. Um, if you want more information on the Optima Health Clinic, you can go to freedomfromme.co.uk where you can order a free information pack and also have a free 15-minute chat with one of the practitioners. You can also go to secretstorecovery.com there's over 100 hours of support materials there which you can access. So thank you for watching. And the next Extra Recovery Live, I don't have the date. It's in about a month. And as it's currently planned, we're talking with David Butcher, who's actually recently become, or a year ago, become chairman of the Optum Health Clinic. So we'll talk about his recovery story and how he became more deeply involved in what we're doing. But thank you for watching. Thank you, Catherine. Pleasure. And we'll talk to you again very soon. Bye-bye.